Brian Koberger nodded as the judge read each of the four murder charges against him. The maximum penalty for that offense if you plead guilty or are found guilty is death and or imprisonment for life. Do you understand? Yes. The father of Kaylee Gonsalves spoke out after coming face to face with the suspect in court for the first time. His demeanor was disheveled, um, beaten, surprised, overwhelmed. He didn't have the swagger that I think he thought he was going to have. A newly unsealed affidavit details the evidence authorities used to connect the 28-year-old Washington State criminology doctoral student to the murders of four Idaho college students. Investigators say one of the two surviving roommates was woken by a noise and heard Kaylee Gonzalve say something like, there's someone here. They say she then heard crying from Zana Carnado's room and a male voice saying, it's okay, I'm going to help you. Documents say the roommate opened her door and stood frozen as a man wearing black clothing and a mask that covered the person's mouth and nose walking toward her. She described him as 5'10 or taller, not very muscular, but athletically built with bushy eyebrows. The man left out the sliding glass door. What remains unclear is why eight hours passed until someone called 911. Police believe Koberger turned off his phone before the murders at 2.47 a.m. The phone dropped off the cell network near his home in Pullman, Washington, then reconnected at 4.48 a.m. near the crime scene just after the murders. Police mapped out his likely route to the house. They say cell phone data also pings Koberger near the victim's home at least a dozen times before the murders and the morning after. It's unclear why he was near the home so often. We have uh, um, information of a white vehicle that was in the area. By the time police had turned to the public for help finding the white Hyundai, Koberger was already on their radar. An officer at Washington State had located his car and noted he had bushy eyebrows. Five days after the murders, Koberger changed his license plate from Pennsylvania to Washington. As they removed evidence from the Moscow, Idaho home, investigators now say they harvested DNA from an empty leather knife sheath found next to the bodies of Kaylee Gonzalez and Madison Mogan. And as they closed in on Koberger, Police say that DNA matched DNA from Koberger's father, which they collected from trash outside the family's Pennsylvania home. As the investigation continues, police have still not revealed a motive in the case. Koberger is due back in court next Thursday. We go over the five biggest revelations from the newly unsealed probable cause affidavit in the University of Idaho murder case. I'm joined by my co-host Anjanette Levy and legendary former homicide detective Phil Waters. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. After being extradited. Well, I will tell you that I was not expecting this amount of detail in the probable cause affidavit. This was an affidavit from Moscow police officer Brett Payne in support of an arrest warrant of Brian Koberger. Now, Pro Koberger has officially been extradited back to Idaho after his arrest in Pennsylvania. He now faces four counts of first-degree murder and burglary for allegedly stabbing to death University of Idaho students Madison Mogan, Zahner Kernodal, Ethan Chapin, and Kaylee Gonsalves inside of their off-campus home. Their bodies were found on November 13th of last year. Koberger has had his initial appearance in Idaho court. No bail was set. He was read the charges. He's due back in court January 12th for a stab status hearing that will precede a preliminary hearing. But we have to talk about this probable cause affidavit. 19 pages. It has been released. And wow. Just wow. Let me bring in my co-host here on Sidebar and correspondent for the Long Crime Network, and Jeanette Levy, who's live in Idaho right now. And we also have with us legendary former homicide investigator Phil Waters, who's been following this case from the very beginning. It's great to have you both on. Phil, I am going to start with you. You called it. And the type of knife that they're talking about is the United States Marine Corps K-Bar. So when I saw this, my thought was, is that, is this person prior military? So the specific weapon, if they're talking about a K-Bar, which is what this is, uh, then there's a possibility that they need to look into military background of some kind. You called it. We asked you about a month ago about the murder weapon, which hasn't been recovered. And you pretty much nailed it because this is from the affidavit. 
As I entered this bedroom, I could see two females in the single bed in the room. Both Gonsalves and Mogan were deceased with visible stab wounds. I also later noticed what appeared to be a tan leather knife sheath laying on the bed next to Mogan's right side. The sheaf was later processed and had K-Bar, USMC, and the United States Marine Corps Eagle Globe and Anchor Insignia stamped on the outside of it. The Idaho State Lab later located a single source of male DNA left on the button snap of the knife sheath. Phil, what do you think? Well, I tell you, I don't know that I nailed it. The the first part of that was a, a K-Bar was what they talked about at the very beginning. Very specific about that being a K-Bar. And one plus one still equals two. So I surmise, in fact, I think um, when we first talked about this, I showed you the K-Bar that I have, that same type of sheath sitting in my office at my home. So the I just think it's it's interesting that as brilliant as he has been portrayed to be, that he has left that piece of evidence behind at the scene. And, and that's what we talk about, you know, the suspect who has this, uh, you know, studying criminology and an interest in police to leave allegedly such an important piece of evidence is just makes no sense. And, Jeanette, we don't know where he got this weapon, allegedly got this weapon from or how it was obtained. And not only that, can you also tell us the significance of the DNA on that sheath and how they were able to match it back to uh, Koberger? Well, it's incredibly significant because the affidavit says that the DNA came from a single male contributor and they were able to determine that it came from uh, Brian Koberger. But the way they were able to determine that, according to the affidavit, was through going through his father's trash at the home in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania, where Brian Koberger was later arrested. And it said that it was like a 99.99998% match or something some crazy, you know, percentage uh, likely to be the son of, you know, Michael Koberger. So there's been a lot of discussion and reporting out there that this happened through genetic genealogy, that they were able to get the dad's DNA through that. And so we're thinking maybe that's likely true since it discussed that in the probable cause affidavit. They went through the trash, got some things, items of DNA, from that trash and we're able to make an identification and link things together through there. And Anjanette, just real quick follow-up. We don't know if, you know, where the knife was purchased. If I know there was talk about whether or not Koberger's father was former military, but nothing like that. We don't have any indication, right? We have no indication of that. One of our viewers asked a question about that, whether or not maybe his father had once been in the military. Uh, but, you know, this is the type of thing where you could probably find this online or the pawn shop, what have you. They, they may be, you know, out there floating around. Okay, so now, Phil, I want to bring your attention to this because later on in the affidavit, they said a short time later, DM, who, by the way, is the roommate it was one of the two roommates on the ground floor a surviving roommate i use that word interestingly because this is what she said according in the affidavit she said that she heard or she thought that she heard well, was gonsalves say something to the effect of there's someone here dm stated that she looked out of her bedroom but did not see anything when she heard the comment about someone being in the house dm said that she opened a door a second time when she heard what she thought was crying coming from kernodal's room DM then said that she heard a male voice say something to the effect of, it's okay, I'm going to help you. DM opened her door for the third time after she heard the crying and saw a figure clad in black, black clothing, and a mask that covered the person's mouth and nose walking towards her. DM described the figure as 5'10 or taller, male, not very muscular, but athletically built with bushy eyebrows. The male walked past DM as she stood in a frozen shock phase. The male walked towards the back sliding glass door. DM locked herself in her room after seeing the male. She said she did not recognize the male. And this leads investigators to believe that the murderer left the scene. We had no idea this happened, Phil. What's your reaction to that? Well, I think that is just good police work in terms of what was released at the beginning of this thing. Uh, we were told at the beginning that the roommates on the first floor heard nothing. And there were a lot of pundits, a lot of people offering their opinions that that was just amazing. That couldn't have happened and this and so forth and so on, as though that was supposed to be revealed at that time. And I think 
I, I don't know this for certain, but my my reading of that would be that was done for the protection of those witnesses and did not want to let anyone know that they had, in fact, seen more than what was conveyed in, in that uh, initial press release. Phil, does it make it odd that if this is true, he why wouldn't he have killed her? And the second question is, why did she not immediately make a phone call? We know that a phone call was made from that residence, either from her or the other roommate, um, at almost noon the next day. What's your response to people who are questioning this? Well, people do different things under stress. And while it's detailed in the affidavit that she saw these things, we don't know that he saw anything. Uh, he's moving around in the dark. He's got this mask over his nose and his mouth. He's already done what he's going to do, or he's on his way to do it. He's already focused on where he's headed and whether it's to leave. And apparently it's, it's to leave the structure. So he's not getting distracted with things going on around him. And remember, it's dark in there. So there's certainly what it indicates to me is that he didn't see her. She saw him, which, which was certainly to her, uh, her benefit. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's also, like you said, how do you judge somebody in that position for what they did? Maybe she froze. Maybe she panicked. And yeah, I got to talk to you. Yeah. And just, yeah so I'll just give you a final word on that. To address the, the, the lack of a phone call at that point in time, uh, she locked the door and she was away from it and she saw the guy leave. So maybe she thought at that point he's gone. You know, I, I'm, I'm locked in and, and we're done here, not having any idea what had actually happened. And Jeanette, I got to go to some of the biggest piece of evidence. I mean, how did they track him, right? We talked about the DNA. The cell phone evidence I find to be so crucial. Can you briefly summarize for our listeners and our viewers the significance of the cell phone evidence? The cell phone evidence is incredibly significant. And one of the key pieces there is the fact that his cell phone pinged off of a tower on the night of the murders at certain points in time. But during a period of time in that window, there's no signal from this cell phone. And I think that's really interesting. And it doesn't come back on. That cell phone doesn't start pinging against a tower again until after police believe the homicides were committed. Also, that cell phone evidence, according to the affidavit, shows that he was in the area of that home on at least 12 occasions between August and November 13th. That August uh, stop, one of the incidents or instances in which his phone was determined to be in that area of the King Road house was on August 21st of that year. He was pulled over at 11.40 p.m. Uh, near the house for a seatbelt violation, and that's a Sunday night. So you would think a PhD student, if it was indeed him and his phone in this area, remember he's uh, maintaining his his innocence. Uh, why is he out and about at 11:40 p.m. at night? So, the cell phone ev evidence in this case, I think, is very significant. I don't think you can hang your hat on it entirely. It's just another kind of piece of the mosaic that is going to, you know, paint this picture that they kept talking about. Law enforcement kept saying they were getting new pieces of information that really painted a picture of what happened that night. And I think it's just another piece of the puzzle or that picture. Yeah. So there was a question about if, if he was stalking the victims. Well, as we said, 12 times before this night, they have the cell phone in this key location, you know, by the house. And as you mentioned, you know, his cell phone turns off during the time of the murders and then comes back on right afterwards. So that's significant. You know, Phil, we talk about how this guy, you know, the suspect is a criminology student, has this interest in criminology, and yet leaving this breadcrumb of trails. The cell phone evidence is one thing. Phil, let's talk about the car itself, the white Hyundai Elantra, which we were all on the search for, because based on this affidavit, to give everybody an idea about the car, there were cameras tracking the car's movement for a long time. And there was even one surveillance video where they see him exit the car. So we know that it belongs to him. We know it's registered to him. They have this car leaving WSU at 2.44 in the morning on the night of the murders. It makes its way to Moscow. It initially makes passes of the house in the early morning hours. It enters the area at 4.04 a.m. and then drives fast from that crime scene at 4.20 a.m. And then is back in Washington at 5.25 a.m. Again, what is your reaction to the way police were able to track him? 
just good old fashioned detective work. I said from the beginning that that's what's going to crack this case. And that's what they did. These guys hit the grindstone and put their noses to it. And the first one of the first things they're going to do, and we've talked about this before, Jesse, is that they're going to go out there and they're going to try to draw from any kind of video surveillance evidence that they can draw from. And that's exactly what they did uh, in reference to the, the, the cell phone. I, I guess he was brilliant enough to turn it off when he was in there doing what he was allegedly doing. But he wasn't smart enough or didn't think about the fact that he needed to turn it off the entire time that he's he's making his uh, reconnaissance of that structure and those people. Andrea, we got about a minute. I want to really briefly talk about this because I thought this was another big revelation. Um, we learned some background history on the defendant as well, didn't we? We learned about his interest in criminology. I know there was a Reddit post that was interesting as well. Can you tell our viewers, our listeners, what we learned about his interest and background? I think it's really interesting about the Reddit post uh, that he, you know, they cited that in the affidavit because that is one of the first things we found when we started looking for information after we learned his name last Friday. And it was this a survey that had been posted asking for criminals to respond or people who had committed crimes to talk about their emotions. And I found that to be really um, interesting that the police found that that was worth mentioning in the probable cause affidavit. And I want to know why they felt that was important, talking about the emotions that people feel, uh, what, what, they're, what they're trying to get at when they put that in the probable cause affidavit. Obviously, uh, criminology, uh, we know that he was a PhD student studying that. We know from talking to students at DeSales University, he 